Um, so this morning, I am going to do what Jock says. Jock told me that it's the clock, and I must watch the clock. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean. I'm joking. <laughs> okay, so this morning I want to talk to us quickly, and, and I'm going to, I'm preaching this Sunday, I'm preaching next Sunday again. So I'm going to, um, this is half of what I want to share, and the other half I'll share next week. Um, I want to talk to us about navigating the narrow way. Navigating the narrow way. Um, if you've got your Bible, you turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. And I'm going to read from verse 30 to 40 in my New Living Translation here. Um, You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the, for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. So I'm going to attempt to share with you from my life this morning how I have walked the wide way, so I'm going to be a bit, it's going to be in the form of a bit of a testimony, um, or a couple of testimonies. How I walked the wide way, the things that happened to me, and how I tried and failed at times to stay on the narrow way by my own personal testimony. So um, a lot of what I'm sharing today will be before I got saved, but I'm going to share what the things when I look back, what the Lord has done. Even that time, where I see the Lord, where I saw the Lord in my life. Okay. Um, Revelations 12, 11 says, I know Andrew preached on this a couple of weeks ago. So, I just want to bring something different in the year. 12, 11, okay. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So um, it says by the word of a testimony. So when we share our testimony, we overcome the devil. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share a bit of testimony. So so um, not only myself, but I believe the rest of us can overcome the devil in certain areas of our lives. Um, the um, Ecclesiastes 3 from verse 1 to 8. Um, from there. there is a time for everything and a season for every activity I made. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of, for war and a time for peace. So there's a time for everything under the sun, the word of God says. So as I um, going to be sharing a couple of very personal things that happened to me. You will see that um, hopefully that the Lord was, even when I was unsaved, that the Lord was in it. Or the Lord was with me, or the Lord was somehow navigating something in my life. Um, Matthew 10 verse 37 to 39 says, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Now, um, the in a lot of in a lot of churches this morning, the this will not be preached. It's not a 
It's not a popular message. Um, this scripture where we tell you you need to love your father and you need to love the Lord more than you love your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your friends, or even, you know. And I'm going to be sharing with you um, what happened to me and where, where I find myself. And next week I'll go on and where I find myself to the point where I came here. Okay. Um, so my family history is that I was born to some very sick, I believe, some very significant co uh, people in the community of King William Sound. Not only because my parents, which are the significant people, my parents were teachers, but they, they were leaders in the Catholic Church. So they were significant people in the community that I grew up in. So they were upstanding people in the community. They were like looked at like that, you know. And um, those of you that don't know, I was born in 1971, which makes me 49 years old. So um, some of you that call me Evan should actually call me Uncle Evan, but anyway, <laughs> we'll get that's a discussion for another day. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> um, yeah. So I grew up in a part but that was, but what was significant about the Catholic Church was that the church was defiant against the apartheid laws of our country at the time. So I pretty much grew up in a very integrated church, although I did see glimpses of apartheid even in the, ch in, in the church as a youngster. Um, at the age of about nine, I had a very, very weird experience one night. Now, those of you that don't know, a child, from the, from the time a child is born, till about the age of, depending upon, um, um, till about six to nine years old, that child, before six, that child is sort of, they, they're still learning, they don't know about right or wrong, but something clicks at that age. And I think for me, when I was about nine, something clicked. So I had a bit of a weird experience, and this is the thing that clicked for me. I realized I was lying in bed one night, and then I just had this overwhelming sensation and the, of the reality of heaven and hell. And I just knew after that, when I look back, I just knew that at that time that I was, um, how should I put it? I was, um, I needed to get to heaven. Because hell was real, but so was heaven. And I knew at that stage something clicked in me. And I, if I look back, it was actually the Holy Spirit. But something clicked in my in my heart and in my spirit at the time that this hell and this heaven thing that I've heard of, it didn't click before. But I had this experience, I believe, with the Holy Spirit. And I want you to remember I'm in the Catholic Church, I'm in a church where where salvation isn't actually preached and where things don't, you know, like some of you would have grown up with, okay? Um, so I knew that heaven was real and I didn't want to end up in hell. I just knew that because that would be eternal damnation. Um, I don't, I'm not stupid. I knew um, that I can't blatantly and deliberately choose hell. I can't. A lot of people actually, I've seen people deliberately reject the gospel and all, but it would be stupid for, for, for any person to do that. Okay. Um, so the narrow road was revealed to me. It showed me also that God was real and so was the devil. I needed to choose God's way above anything else. I was not saved yet. I just knew that there was a heaven and hell, a God and a devil, and that I needed to choose heaven and God. Then, when I was 14 years old, a very significant thing happened in my life. When I was 14, that was probably the worst thing, the worst year of my life. Um, I was in standard six, what we call grade eight today, but it was probably the worst thing that happened uh, in my life. 
I was at the beginning of that year, I was molested by a Catholic priest. It had a significant effect on my life. And I believe that from there, I really developed anger issues towards unfairness and bullying. And I had to learn to fight for my place in life and for my place in my family even. I never wanted to be taken advantage of. And I made sure that what happened to me will not happen to me or anyone that I loved. That was at the beginning of my when I was 14. Secondly, when I was 14, like I said, when I was 14, because it's quite a hectic year, I almost drowned towards the end of December 1985. I was not safe. But what was significant about me almost drowning was that I saw in a vision minutes before I drowned, I saw in a vision. I looked, we were at the dam, you know the dam wall? So we were walking on the top of the dam wall. And as I looked at the top of the dam wall, people were swimming at the, it was December time, very hot. And the people were swimming in the dam at the bottom. And when the people were swimming in the dam at the bottom, we looked down on them swimming and then we walked around uh, because we were going to go swim. And I saw in a vision, let me tell anybody about, about this, I saw in a vision somebody drowning. But nobody was drowning at the time. So, so I thought, maybe just somebody's going to drown. Obviously, I'm not safe, so I don't understand visions, prophet, the prophetic or anything else. I just saw that somebody was, I just thought, okay, somebody's going to drown here someday. And somebody was, what just name, somebody, uh, or somebody did drown, or somebody is going to drown here yeah, one day. Needless to say, we went into the water to go swim. I was the one that almost drowned. I was like, I was taken, taken out. And as I was splashing, panicking, um, before I lost consciousness, I saw my life of just 14 years flashing before my eyes. So, and then miracle upon miracle, the Lord um, added that a doctor and, and, a, and a nurse was at the scene. They, my father tried to revive me and he gave up. And then the doctor and the nurse came and the doctor revived me. And um, the doctor and the nurse revived me. And the doctor told my father that um, the only reason he asked my father, do I do sport? So my father said, yes, he's an athlete. And he said, because I had such a strong heart. If I didn't have such a strong heart, I wouldn't have made it. I would have died. And it was significant in a sense that I would have died without Christ. I saw my life flashing before my eyes. And before I lost consciousness, I just knew I was on my way to hell at the age of 14 which is hectic, to say the least. Um, I was still not saved. Why was I still not saved? I believe because I was in the Catholic Church and they did not preach salvation. So even if I wanted to get saved, I did not even know what to do or where to start. So, it's epic. I I didn't even know, I'm not kidding you, I didn't even know one person that was saved. Okay, I'm young, I'm in school, I'm enjoying my life in school, but I didn't know not even one person that was saved. So I didn't know what to do, where to go, I just knew I, need, I needed to get saved. Then, at the age of 20, I was, I was in my third year at university, but something significant happened the year before. There's no university where you go wild. <laughs> um, remembering that, I'm going to quickly backtrack to my life. When I was 14, like I said, it was the most hectic year of my life. I started drinking alcohol. And when I, when I was 18, when I started university, and at university, you go out, you're free, your parents aren't there. 
So you in a room and you, your friends say, listen, we're going out for a drink. So you go out for a drink. You go out Wednesday night. You go out Friday night. You go out Saturday night. That was just the given. You drink Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. Like I, told, I think I told Jock the other day. And then we did back-to-back -back drinking. So you drink from Sunday to Monday. Sunday to Monday. So at the age of 18, I realized, listen, yeah, I have a problem. <laughs> I was explaining to Jacques why I don't, the other when we were rapping, I was explaining to him why I don't touch alcohol because I've got a problem with it. Um, so for me, when I was 18, I, I realized, I started drinking at 14 when I was 18. Um, I could only drunk and he's here for drink. <laughs> so I had his mouth for drinking, you know. But I realized I, I was an alcoholic. I needed to admit that to myself. And um, so these things happen. I'm trying to stop drinking. I'm, I'm really trying to stop drinking. But you're at university and I'm in the first team at volley volleyball at, 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 at the university. So we, we play and we drink and we drink and we play and so it just goes on. It's just a, a never ending cycle. So I was in my third year at university. But what happened is that my best friend got saved the previous year when we were 19, my second year. Uh, so at the age of 20, it had already been a year that my best friend got saved, my best friend at university. And he had been ministering to me through the word of God, through Christian music and his lifestyle. I was still not saved, but I knew I needed to get saved and now sort of knew what to do. I sort of knew I needed to surrender my life to Christ. But I didn't know exactly what to do. It was like I was, I know I need to surrender, but how do I do it? You know? Um, so what happened is that we had the, uh, my friend belonged to not the the SCA, he belonged to yeah he belonged to the SCA, but they also had his people. I don't know if you had his people on the campuses. On the campuses at the university, those yes, his people start coming up. Um, okay, okay, you know these people, but it's a campus ministry of students. So these people were there, and they used to do. They used to go door to door. They used to knock on the doors of the people. We, we, we at least, most of us, 80% at Rose University where I was, 80% of us were, at, um, were in residence and in our schools. So they come to your door, they knock on your door, and can we come and have coffee, can we talk to you, and then they, they minister to you and they bring you to Christ. And this, this was like, this is quite a funny story because most nights, my friend is saying, he's doing this, I'm not saying I'm not going with them. Yeah? I'm but like, I'm lying then, I'm telling him I'm not going with you. I can't be seen with you, it's going to be, you know, my reputation. <laughs> so it's like, so then they go out, my friends go out, and my friends are like, my, oh, my friend goes out, and I know that they are doing evangelism. Then I go back into my room. And I'm lying in bed and then I'm praying. I'm literally praying. No, I'm not praying a bad prayer. I'm praying a good prayer. Lord, let them knock on my door. I don't know. I need to get saved. I don't know what to do. I'm too embarrassed to tell my friend. <laughs> I need to get saved. So I'm praying. Lord, let them knock on my door. Then they don't come. So I'm like, no, 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 no. this is never going to happen. So anyway, so... But what happened was that I realized that God was navigating away. I wasn't ready. Sometimes our salvation, we need to be ready. You must be right for the picking. You can't be, you can't be, um, and I'm going to explain to now why you need to be ready. Because some of us make decisions quickly. And, and, and I'm going to explain to us um, just now. I was still not saved, but I knew I needed to get saved. I, mean, I knew, I now sort of knew what to do. I had surrender my life to my life to Jesus. During my third and fourth year at university, and this is why you need to be right for the beginning, this is what happened to me. I was counting the cost of me giving my heart to Jesus. When you, when you give your heart to Jesus, 
when you surrender something, when you even now walk with the Lord, this is a narrow way. And before you take your first step on that narrow way, you need to come to cost. Because it's not in, like, like the word says when we, when we the, the word that we get earlier. It's a narrow way, it's not an easy way. And that's why you need to come to cost. Um, let's go to Luke 14, verse 25 to 28. Let's quickly see what it says. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. <clears throat> uh, verse 28. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower, will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? So you need to count the cost. Why? Because a lot, I've seen a lot of Christians. I've been, I've been a Christian for 26, I'm going for my 27 years as a Christian, and I've seen a lot of Christians. They don't count the cost. They don't realize that um, it's almost like when, when, we, when me and Jacques go running, we go running and there's one thing on our mind. We're going to go run. The thing that is automatic is we know we're not going to turn back. We're going to run like yesterday we ran 10 k's. We're going to run until we get to 10 k's. We're going to run until we get to 10 k's. We've, been, we've, we've run during lockdown. And then the one day shop, me and him, I'm quickly going to embarrass shop, and then he doesn't mind. We were running, and then we said we're going to run eight guys. And then we, we like, get to the stadium, we were running from the stadium. We get to the stadium, and John said, um, now we, we short. We get into the stadium, and we've done seven guys. So John said, it's just the seven guys I said to him now. No, 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 no. So what happens is that in our walk with the Lord, we need to realize that this walk is not an easy walk. And you've got to make up your mind like I, like I did with Jean. I said to him, we will not do seven kinds. We've come short. We will do that last kind. So when we do it, we need to count the cost. You need to count the cost. So I was counting the cost. Now you must remember, I mean, my... Third year at university, I'm like 21 years old. Um, verse, verse 28a in my, I'm going to quickly go to the new living year. I'm going to read you what Luke 14, verse 28a says here in my Bible, which is the new living translation. It says this. But it says here, that, that is the New International Version, verse 28 it says here, but don't begin until you count the cost. Don't begin until you count the cost. Because this navigating the narrow way is, or the going through the narrow gate is not an easy thing. Don't begin until you count the cost. So for me, I was, I was, a, I was sort of getting to the point where I was right for the picking. But I needed to count the cost of my salvation first. I needed to count the cost. And I'll explain it to you now. I counted the cost for my salvation for approximately two years. Why? I knew that I was going to disappoint my father, my mother, my community, and my brothers, and my sisters, and my friends. And I was going to lose friends. I was going to lose... I was going to lose it all. Um, but remember, this decision made the difference for me between heaven and hell. I need to make sure that even if I was rejected by everyone because of the gospel, and I was, I needed to be ready. So I needed to count the cost. I'm sitting there in my room at night, and I'm counting the cost of this decision. Because this, the cost of this decision meant that I will be, um, 
I will be, what do you call it, what's the word? I will be persecuted. It meant that I will be persecuted. It meant that, um, and this is what happened in my, in my family, it meant that I was walking around in my house and people, I was like invisible. Like, um, say, but then I'm just sitting there and I'm Billy when they will come. I don't care how I am. I'm proud of it. I don't care. Because he knew me. It was, it was <laughs> invisible. <laughs> it was he. Can you know, but it's man for the intersect. It was man for the intersect. It was totally invisible. That, that was it, what, what was it was like in my house. So, um, that's the reason why I needed to be ready, because I knew persecution was coming. And I needed to cover the cost of my persecution. And then I needed to make up my mind before going into a relationship with the Lord. I needed to make up my mind that whatever happens, I was going to stand. That whatever happens, I was going to stand. I spoke to my funny, funny story. Things are coming in the Lord told me this week that Things are coming around in my family. My one cousin grew up with us and he was in the house when I got saved. So he told me, he spoke to me this week. He phoned me. He spoke to me about some other family things. Uh, he was very close to me, he's sort of like a brother to me, and he said to me, um, he works, he's, he's, he stays in the room, but he works in Kirk too. So he spoke to me and he said to me, Evan, Remember when I, I, I'm going to speak Afrikaans? I said, even on the way to the bomb bars, this, this was the day I told my parents I'm saying. That, that, that's what he called it. The bomb bars. <laughs> I said, to that bomb bars. So we're talking, me and him, this week. And he's, remember, he's Catholic as well. He's well, got a family, he's got children, he's in the front And he's actually out, out of all my family, he's the one that's. Proximity wise, because he stays in the room, he's the closest to me. Um, and he was in cut to and he says to me, I need to come speak to you. Because it's come full circle. And the Lord has been ministering to him because he's working in cut to on one of the minds and his boss is saying that his boss is ministering to him. And he said to me, he's been reading books, he's been reading the Bible, he's been listening to preachers. I don't know, you got some clips of me preaching on YouTube. I think we're right. So he said to me, I was listening to you preach the other day. So tomorrow I'm having coffee with him. Because he is busy. What is he doing? He's come from the coast and he said to me, I know it's going to be a thing for my family. For the church, he's very involved to the Catholic Church in Rome. But he's realized that he needs to give his life to the Lord. And if I didn't stand, if I didn't stand when I needed to stand and count the cost, we would hear God. He would have no one to go to. He would have no one to. Because he can relate. Because I come from the same background and I went through it. And he, he could tell me, listen here, today, Bombash. He said, from the ark, the Bombash, to the net, everyone. Anyway, so, in conclusion, some of us are fans of Jesus. Some of us are in a relationship with Jesus for what we can get out of it or out of him. But Jesus called us to be disciples. A disciple is somebody that comes to cost. Jesus is not calling you and me so that we can be part of his fan base. No. He's not calling you and me so that we can see what we can get out of him. That is a one-sided relationship. He is calling you to enter and journey with him via the narrow gate. It is a call to discipleship. In Luke 14, verse 25, the decree may be read it to you from the New Living. Um, you can follow on, you can listen to it. You don't need to put it up um, for me. I'm gonna just read from you. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. 
your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would be, begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or one king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him. And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. And in a Catholic church, family is everything. And I needed to give up my family. My, my cousin who I'm having coffee with tomorrow knows he needs to give up his family. His mother his mother's gonna help him. His father passed on a long time ago, but he knows his mother's going to hate him. But he needs to, like he says here, hate his mother more in comparison to Jesus. So you cannot give up. You cannot become a disciple without giving up everything you own. This is how you enter the narrow gate. How? By giving up everything you own. Your father, mother, brother, sister, wife, husband, positions, everything, everything. Your thinking, your outlook on life, your aspirations and desires, everything. You need to count the cost of entering by the narrow gate. If you lose your life, you will find it. If you lose your life, you will find it. I needed to lose my life. I was popular in school. I was like, I was talking to Caleb. Um, about the school because Caleb didn't have a, a nice um, school life yeah, in Kimberley. And then I told her, I told her one day, I was being honest with her, I said, I can't relate because I was extremely popular in school. I was, everybody loved me. <laughs> um, one or two teachers didn't like me, but it was because I was popular. <laughs> So I was extremely popular in school, and Kayla, I said to Kayla, I can't feel like you know, because you were popular in school. But I, I actually saw certain things that I do to let her go through what she needed to go to and, 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 and stand for that. And so we need to lose our lives. We need to lose our lives. I was reading something on Facebook the other day where and I, and I actually posted it. Those of you that are friends with me on Facebook were interpreted. This guy said something to the sick He said, um, the heroes of the church in the Bible were the martyrs, which means those people that were killed for their faith like Stephen. Today, you, you are considered an on-fire Christian. An on fire Christian when you just make it to church every Sunday. So you said, What's wrong with us? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with us when I have to beg you to come to church? When the martyrs died for it. When, when there's a cost attached to this life. When the enemy wants to take you out. Um, I shared today where I almost drowned. That was the first time that the enemy tried to take me out. I'm going I'm to share with you the other two times when I almost died. Next week. So I want to encourage us the way to enter the narrow gate is to count the cost. But to make that decision for Jesus and to never turn back. I always tell people that if you, um, I always tell Christians, have you been persecuted? And in the Lord, no, what is that? Then I don't know. 
I don't know if you are a Christian. I don't know if you stood for Jesus yet. I don't know if you have caused people to hate you because of Jesus. I don't know. If it's easy, it's the way it can. If it's difficult and it costs you something, it's the narrow road. So I want to encourage us today. Choose the narrow way. Choose the narrow way. Take these scriptures and go meditate on it. But let God show you in your own life where you need to navigate to enter the narrow way. Amen. Let's quickly pray. Finish off. Thank you, Lord, for this day. And Lord, I thank you that even, even today, I know it's a bit of a hectic word, but this is the word that you want to be to share. And I thank you, Lord, that, that we can look at our lives and we can look back and we can say, oh, this, maybe I'm, I didn't enter the narrow gate. Because, Lord, you have called us, you haven't called us to be a fan, you haven't called us to be whatever else, you've called us to be disciples. And Matthew 28, verse 19 says, we need to make disciples. And I believe that's why um, you want me to preach this, because we need, need to make disciples. In order to be a disciple, I need to give up everything I own, everything I need to count the cost, and then I need to enter that narrow gate. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would be able to enter that narrow gate so you can stand before you one day and you can say, you enter that narrow gate, well done, good and faithful sir. In Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Now say, you know, um, I think the leaders, we are meeting on Tuesday, yeah? mm -hmm. um, for, for a time of prayer. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the Sunday. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.